Hello everyone and welcome to The Creative Experience. Today it's my great pleasure to be interviewing Petri Anderson. I've known Petri for a number of years. He is a contemporary of mine. He is a British stained glass artist and he paints in the traditional style. Quite often I have interviewed artists who are more avant-garde, who are pushing at the boundaries of stained glass, but I think it is also really important to celebrate glass artists who are using the medium in the traditional sense. And we get into that conversation during the interview today. The inspirations for his work come from two primary sources. The first is the wealth of 19th and early 20th century British stained glass, and the second is woodland habitats. The rich drapery depicted around the turn of the century is particularly alluring to Petri, and his Finnish heritage certainly contributes to his love of woodlands. You can see more of Petri's work on his website. I'll leave links in the description below to his website and also to his Instagram page, which has more exciting and interesting work. So I do hope you enjoy today's interview. Leave comments and remarks and suggestions for future artists that you'd like me to interview. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. Petri, <laughs> hi, welcome to The Creative Experience. Thank you, great to be here. It is fantastic to see you. Now, um, we were in conversation with one another on social media for quite a period of time, and this is the first time that we've actually met, so it's, it's really lovely to see you in person, and you've brought some of your art today. Um, mm -hmm. I know you from creating fantastic sort of fantasy pieces of glass that you post on social media, really technically sophisticated. Um, and I want to get into a little bit of detail about that with you and we'll talk about these pieces. But uh, what I'd love to learn is a little bit about you and your background. How did you get into stained glass in the first place? Well, it wasn't the most conventional of routes. I started, when I left school, I went to, uh, had a year in the industry working as an electron microscopist. And then I went on to do a physics degree at Birmingham University. And after a year of laboriously trying to understand higher level physics, I realized this wasn't anything that I wanted to do as a career. So I left after a year, not quite knowing what I was going to do. Um, but there was a very good, well-regarded well stained glass studio very close to where I live, Chapel Studio. And uh, I knocked on their door and uh, asked them if they had a job. And uh, they, yeah, they gave me a trial, and really it, uh, it went on from there. So I, what, what year was this that you arrived at Chapel Studios? That was 89, 1989. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I didn't have any formal training, and I think they were about to advertise for a, for a trainee, and they would have gone to the art colleges or the glass colleges, and I just got in there before they had the chance to do that, and had an opportunity which really shouldn't have come my way and what was the kind of thinking behind changing to a to a sort of creative uh, career well my mother was a potter yeah. um, and uh, so there's there's always been the arts in our family um, and I my dad was a physicist so I was sort of brought up with the notion that you really can't make a living in the arts get a <laughs> get a physics. possibly not wrong <laughs> <laughs> still struggling through yeah but uh, yeah, so that's, yeah, I was sort of still finding my way at that age. You know, when you're at school, you really don't quite know what you want to do or what your future's got. Um, so I went down the safe route initially, what, what was perceived as a safe route, and uh, then realised I wanted to live a little bit more dangerously. <laughs> Fantastic, yeah. So yeah, the creative, the artist won over, over the scientist at yeah, the end of the day. Yeah. It, was, it was always there in my heart, but... Uh, I think it took a while for the confidence to kick in to have a go, you know, making a living out of it. Mm. So you really started at Chapel Studios knowing really nothing about the art and craft of stained glass and so you learned from the ground up. Did, they, did you mm. start on just basic glass cutting and cementing and that, that type of route? Is that how you worked or did you go straight into designing and painting? Uh, design took, to, uh, came a lot, a lot later on in the career. Um, it was initially I had a month's trial on the on the bench, sort of doing the lead work, and then a month's trial doing some glass painting. And uh, yeah, I started just painting small border pieces and th the basic, easy things to do. And as I got more competent, then I was given bigger challenges. And and I, I was also given a key to the studio, which meant that in my own time I could pop in there and 
stretch myself and so I'd, I'd be painting, trying to paint things which really I wouldn't have been able to get my hands on in the general run of things. That is a fantastic opportunity and as you mm. say it's extremely rare. It's very, it's very rare to find studios that have the time and the resources to train someone up from scratch. So tell me what happened after Chapel. Well, yeah, about, I think it was around 2005, I, I, I decided to make a go of it on my own. Um, still have very good relationships with Chapel, and uh, I did a lot of subcontractual work up until very recently. And, and uh, yeah, so I just spread my wings and tried to see what the world had for me. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, and what kind of work are you doing now as an independent artist? What's, what's the type of work that you find yourself doing? I still do a mix. Um, mm -hmm. I don't do as much of the restoration work as I used to. So a lot of new work and a lot of these autonomous panels as well. I'm trying to, trying to get some more gallery work and uh, an exhibition work through. Um, but I'll, I'll take whatever comes along, you know, I'm, I enjoy the variety. Um, and how do you, do you use social media mostly to prom 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 promote your work, is that how you...? Yeah, that's the way it's going at the moment. I used to do quite a few mail shots, yeah. um, and also it's very visual, and being a visual art, you know, it's, uh, it lends itself towards that sort of communication and selling your, selling your, your, your trade. Yeah, I, I certainly find um, social media ha is is a tremendous platform for reaching people that you might normally not mm. be put in contact with because it's sort of worldwide and, and people will see your work, you know, in America, in, in, in Europe, obviously in the mm. UK. And I think that's what's, that's what's exciting about social media is that it's sort of free to take part in. You know, there is no, it's just really your time and how much time you want to put into sort of promoting your work. But certainly mm. this, the, the work that I've seen has been spectacular. I mean, it's a very, very high standard. Thank you. Um, and I've seen a lot of your, well, I've seen a number of the pieces that you've created for Chapel Studios as well, which are, again, really, you know, really high standard work. Just talk us through the process of creating a design, say for a, for a church commission. Do you start on paper and then move on to procreate or do you work with Procreate immediately from the off? Now I work exclusively in Procreate. Yeah, I do very little on paper. Um, so I'll, I'll do all my designing on there, even from the point of, from the site visit, I'll take a photograph of the, of the window and the opening, and I'll use that as the basis and I'll sketch out the shape from that. Um, I might use the computer just to change the parallax and make sure it's absolutely square. Um, but after that, it's yeah, it's all on Procreate. In effect, I, I I negate the need for a cartoon. I go straight from design to cut line, um, uh, because on the Procreate you can zoom in, you know, pinch and zoom right in. You can draw in the details at the design stage um, that are at the right resolution. That once it's blown up, you, you know, it's it's good enough to work from. Which obviously you wouldn't be able to do that on paper if you were doing a traditional A4 design on paper. Of course. You, you can't get that level of detail, yeah, but you can yeah. with Procreate because you can go, you can zoom right in on, on different areas and build up the detail in the specific areas you need to. So tell me a little bit about some of the projects that you are working on at the moment. I'm, at the moment I'm preparing some pieces for an exhibition at the Stained Glass Museum. So I've got a, I've got a, a design which I did quite a few years ago, but I never got around to making, which I thought would be ideal for the exhibition and it's a it's a heraldic design but not as you've seen heraldry before it's going to be quite a quite a departure from traditional heraldry it's, it's based on the royal coat of arms um, and uh, it's very much in line with what I've been doing with forestry scenes up to now so tell me a little bit about the processes that you use when you make your stained glass we touched on the fact that both you and I work a lot in the traditional using the traditional techniques. Mm. But how do you, for example, mix your paints? What mediums do you use and how do you apply your paints to glass? Mm. Well, I start with a vinegar trace, um, but I put a lot more time and energy in that than I was traditionally taught. Um, so I'll do a lot of the basic line work as you would, uh, with very dense lines, very dark paint. Uh, but then I'll, I'll wash down the, the vinegar trace to a very washy, watery mix. So there's still the vinegar in there, 
but uh, I'll, I'll do a lot of little micro shading um, and little puddles of, uh, of watery trace and, uh, and just build up the image there so there's a lot more paint on at the trace stage than maybe your more traditional artist would use and uh, then I'd fire that in. Yeah. Second stage would be a traditional gum arabic and water mix uh, with a stipple, quite a tight stipple, I, I tend to use quite a tight stipple just to get a bit of texture in there and then work that back by removing in the traditional way and then my last stage is again it's the gum and water but I cover the glass with water and you have to rub it really hard to make sure you, you don't get these little greasy areas where there, there isn't any water so it's quite laborious in rubbing the glass with water and then I badger that water there's no paint in this stage just water and then I'll I'll do almost like a pointerly effect with a trace brush and just dip on the water um, little spots of paint where the shadows need to be deeper and then with a tiny badger brush just badger those to soften them and I find it's a it's a much more economical way of doing your second mat because the way I was taught would be just to repeat the first mat process and then you, you end up removing most of the paint yeah but exactly. this way you're actually getting most of it where you want it badgering it in and let that once it's where I'm, where I'm happy you know where the paint is uh, where I, largely where I want it I let that dry and then I just rub away a little bit of excess but very little Mm. But with your work, um, you are doing a lot of um, traditional painting, but you're doing acid etching. You're acid etching away layers of glass as well. Do you mm. work with sandblasting or do you use uh, acids for that? No, I haven't got a sandblaster, so everything's acid, acid etched or abraded. Um, I've just started a little bit of diamond abrading, got inspired by some of the work of Judith Jectus and uh, yeah, so there's a little bit of abrading going on, um, a little bit of engraving. But largely, it's any, any, any colour removal is largely done with acid hydrofluoric. Yeah. I tend to use sandblasting, but it, it doesn't have the same subtleties. There's nothing really to mm. beat acid etched glass, is there? That's right. I've got a, I built a little fume cupboard, so I'm, I'm well protected when I'm, when I'm acid etching. So earlier on this year, uh, we were both invited over to America. Uh, because 2022, this year, is the year of glass. And we were going to fly over together, and unfortunately I had to pull out for health reasons. But you attended that conference. I saw it on social media, and it looked absolutely fantastic. Tell yeah. us a little bit about that conference. Yeah, it was a great experience for me. I uh, got to meet a whole bunch of guys who I knew of through social media and through Facebook, Instagram. Uh, but to actually meet them in the flesh and build those connections in real life was fantastic and it was a really encouraging time for me as well. Um, I made a small panel for their auction. They, they, they have a, a charity auction each year um, to raise funds for um, bursaries and uh, so I sent a little panel out ahead of, ahead of my going and, uh, and yeah it did, did very well in the auction and I was surprised at the how much the panel went for, which made me think, well, there's a market in the, in the States <laughs> Absolutely. for what I do. And uh, I've since had one, one more commission out there, which was lovely. Um, and also really encouraged me um, with what I'm doing with my, with my nature panels, because they've been a little bit speculative. I, have, you know, I haven't known whether there's going to be a market for those. And uh, yeah, just to see, see that do well in the auction was a really encouragement for, for me to pursue that and keep going with with those panels definitely and how did you find what's your sense of the american scene the american glass scene because obviously we both have experience of working here in the uk but what mm. what was it like to go to the states and meet other studio workers and other artists and what, what, what was your what were your what were your impressions i think a lot of the the rules which we have here are a lot more relaxed in the States as regards what you can do with glass. They're, they're happy to embrace new techniques. Um, I think there's a lot of that here, in, here as well, but I mean, the fusing scene is huge now. It's really taken off with uh, Narcissus and Tim Carey, and that's exciting. And there's a lot of guys who are sort of taking that on board and, and running with that, and uh, they're running classes. And I think the what Bullseye are doing with their compatible range is really 
it really opens it up itself up to new creative ideas in glass. So yeah, it's exciting. So what I like to do when I'm talking to fellow artists is ask them to perhaps speak a little bit about three of their either favourite projects or significant projects that they've worked on over the years, things that you, you might want to bring uh, to the audience that, that's watching today, projects that are of particular uh, interest to you. Mm. Well, I've, because I started as a restoration glass painter, I've still got a, a huge fondness for some of the restoration projects I was involved in. Uh, one, of the, one of the more challenging ones for me was, um, f it was a church in Uckfield in the, on the, in the south of England. Um, and it was a Henry Holiday window, which, um, which had a, a huge amount of paint loss. And they actually started losing the paint within the first decade of it being installed. Virtually everything had gone. The only thing which was remaining was the heads, hands, and, and um, yeah, just, just the flesh tones, really, because they complained early on. And, um, and he, he, Holiday, or the studio he worked with, I think it was done at Whitefriars, they repainted as a token gesture the head and the, and the hands. But everything else, they left. So we had this window which had pristine flesh work, but the rest was just gone. So was this a particularly challenging project for you? It was because it was a case of repainting everything and, and, and apart from the, the, the flesh tones. And um, I think the regulations and the, the protocols back then, this was quite a few years ago, we, we were doing things then which maybe we wouldn't do now, we'd have a different approach. So everything was recut. So. And it was a case of trying to work out what the paint, or where the trace lines were originally. And there's, there was nothing to go by except for if you, if you had held the glass at a certain angle, you could see the ghost image of where the trace line used to be. Yeah. So what I did was I, I actually traced on the original glass where I could see, holding the glass at an angle, just so, uh, just so I, could, I could see where the, where the trace lines were. Yeah and then use those trace lines on the original glass almost as a cartoon for tracing on new glass yeah. which are laid on top. Um, so we've got, um, we got a, a great selection of glasses from Lambert's to match the original glass and, uh, and repainted everything. And uh, I think the original glass went into storage in the uh, repository and um, they got in effect a new window. But I had to, I had to paint a Henry Holiday window which was technically you know, very precise, very high level glass painting. So that was a, that was a lovely challenge and I really enjoyed trying to paint in his style. We also found another window which, where he reused the same cartoon. Um, so we were able to take photographic reference images as well as the ghost images from the, from the old trace lines. Fantastic. So between the two we were able to, yeah, do a, a very good reproduction. Project number two? Ooh. Probably, I did some quite a bit of work for a college, um, Haleybury College in Hartford, and uh, yeah, there was there were two windows which were blank either side of a central window. So it wasn't technically a three light window, but the lights were so close together that it almost behaved as one. It's yeah, and uh, so I had to recreate or I had to design two flanking windows for the central crucifixion window. And, uh, and that, was a, that was a lovely project. It, it was a, the design process went on for a long, long time. It was a lot of re reworking and uh, working alongside the archivists at the college. So it was a design process, a very collaborative design process. Where we would design little elements of the window and then build it up together. And so that was a, that was a, great, uh, a great project from a design point of view, because it because it was challenging in as much as it wasn't just down to me to design something. It was a, a lot of dialogue and a thick wad of, I was working on paper back then, so a thick wad of paper of different stages and different elements of the design to build up the final, the final design. It's always a challenge, isn't it? Getting into the mindset of another artist and, mm. and, and their, their, their visual language, their visual style, the weight of paint that they use and mm. that, the, the quality of their line. It, it's, it's a real detective process, isn't it? Where you kind of, you develop an understanding of their methods and then you sort of almost inhabit them and become a, 
a ghostwriter, I imagine, mm. something that someone who's who's recreating in their style. That we didn't want to do pastiche. We didn't want to do something which was pretending to be old, which wasn't. Yeah. So there were contemporary elements, but there had to be enough in the design that tied it through to the to the older glass. So it's it's finding that balance of tweaking some of the vocabulary. There was like um, parts of it had a, a, a quarry painted quarry background. Yep. So we used that sort of grid of rectangles, but then we would incorporate wiggles within the grid. So just to sort of give it a bit of a bit of an interest and a bit of a just to pull it away from something which was old. And yeah. So it wasn't pretending to be something else. And uh, so yeah, we, we had fun with it. Fantastic. Um, Fantastic. Um, and project number three. Probably these these nature panels which I'm doing, these wildlife panels. Um, that's more of an ongoing thing, and uh, yeah, it's, it's it's something which is preoccupying me at the moment, and really taking all my creative energy, and I'm really enjoying. Yeah, fantastic, mm. fantastic. Well, this was my submission for the um, uh, the BSMGP centenary uh, exhibition, and it's uh, it's two layers thick, so there's um, there's a layer of kind of a smoky ruby on the front and the back plate is uh, two mil float glass. So between the two layers I was able to get um, some copper copper stain which gives a nice pinky pinky hue on two mil. Yeah. And with silver stain on the back you get these lovely oranges so the mushrooms just sort of pop out with the, um, the combination of the silver stain and the copper stain. This is absolutely exquisite, Petri. It really is a beautiful piece. I have not really used copper stain very much, so it, it's a more intense colour, is it? It's a sort of a slightly more browny orange, is it? Or No, it's, it's quite a nice red. Um, okay. It, 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 it varies depending on the thickness of glass you use, because it, what it does, it reacts with the tin side of the float glass. To give the red, um, it won't it won't touch the other side, the the non tin side. So um, because of the, the the float process, when you make two mil float, it rolls out over the tin, the, the molten tin surface quicker. That's how they make it thinner. Um, so it's in contact with the tin for for less time. So if you do if you use a three mil float, you get a much deeper red. Yes. Um, but uh, with a two mil, you're limited to quite a pale pink. This is one of the uh, the earlier wildlife scenes which I did, and uh, yeah, so it's based on a, a bit of forest near where I live in Ashridge. It's a National Trust property, and they, you get these lovely moss beds over old fallen wood, and uh, it's uh, it's quite shady, so there's a lot of moisture there, and the moss just the, the moss just loves it. So uh, this was taken. The photograph which it was based on was taken. I think it was Boxing Day, so it's a real winter scene, and the moss is at its uh, at its best around then. Yeah. I love this transition here in here between this sort of yellowy green to this more bluey green here. This is lovely. I love that transition. Mm. Yeah, whenever I get a, a, a change in colour like that, I try and bring elements of this colour through with stain. So yeah. just, just to unite it, so you don't get a harsh. A harsh change from from yellow green to blue green. Yes. So these little bits of stain just help to unify it. Absolutely. And then you've got a different green happening here as well. So you've got this sort of bluey green here, and then a much more sort of mid tone green. Yeah, that's again that's still the same green, but there's, there's a bit of stain on the back just to bring it yellower. And without the paint, because I've gone down to clear glass, it's 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 a, more, a lot more vibrant. It's a it's a different way of thinking about design as well, because traditionally. Well, what, the way I was trained was you basically whenever there's different color you put a lead around it or where there's an object you put a lead around it yeah and um, with with these panels I've had to do quite a bit of rethinking so often I'll, I'll run leads along branches along the shadows of branches or in shadows within the scene but because I'm defining things with color rather than line work it holds up um, if, if this was the same colour glass all the way across, I would need a much thicker trace line to delineate yes. the, the fox from the background. Yes. But because the colour is doing the delineation, the effect of, ha 
palation where the, 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 the trace line thins as light comes through yes. is diminished. Um, so I can go, I can be a lot more delicate and um, a lot finer with my detailing. I call this one trouble in paradise because the, the badges aren't getting on. And what is your fining temperature for this type of work? With the paintwork, I fire it about 660, 670 in an electric kiln. Um, the stain is typically around 540. Um, and do you have a soaking time when you get up to temperature for the stains and paints? Generally, no. But with this one piece with the deer, because I'd already broken the first one, I did put an annealing, annealing soak at around, I think it was around 540, just for about three minutes. One of the things which does concern me a little bit is where we, the next generation of glass artists are going to learn their, their skill base from. Um, I learned as a restoration glass painter and uh, when, I, when I started in stained glass there were a lot of things which we were doing which just wouldn't be done now um, and for, for very good reasons, for right reasons. Uh, we were repainting a lot of Victorian glass when things got broken. Now there's a, a big emphasis on on using adhesives to 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 you know fuse fractured glass back together and, and retain all of the original glass, which is fantastic and and right. I I I'm not kicking against that, but my concern is that there has to be a vehicle whereby people can actually learn the finer points of glass painting, and. Um, what I would love to see is uh, maybe a gallery network where glass, which is at the high fine art level of glass painting, something which competes with oil painting and watercolours and other art forms, sculpture, uh, at a higher level where people can actually progress and, and, and go on and, and these skills aren't lost with time. Because um, I think it's, uh, we are in danger of, of losing the skill base, which historically has been passed on from glass painter to glass painter through restoration glass painting. I, I completely agree with you. Mm. I, I absolutely, because the, the skills that you're demonstrating with your work are hard won skills. The mm. skills that you only develop over a period of time where you, you develop a feel for the paint that you're working with, an mm. affinity for the materials. And that that's not something you can just pick up from a book or even a, you know, a, a four year degree course. You really have to work at it, don't you? You do. And I try to pass on as much as I can through social media. When I post images of my work, I tend to do progress shots so people can see how things are progressing. I hope that that helps people understand some of the processes I use and how we get to the finished article. I just know how I learned, and I learned by watching a master glass painter paint day in, day out, and me trying to emulate what he's been doing, and uh, and slowly develop that skill base. And there has to be a process whereby that can go on, you know, moving forward. And obviously, some of the traditional studio practices aren't necessarily that way forward anymore um, but there has to be another way so if there's a way that you know through maybe through classes and through um, having an outlet for finer art painting and f finer design more, more delicate more refined then I think that's the possibly a way that we can keep these these skills alive. Petri it's been absolutely wonderful to have you in the studio today to talk about your work and to also uh, get to handle your work and to see it in detail. So mm. thank you so much for joining me here today. Thank you.